Hello, I'm Rena Dutt, a producer at Directors Lab West. For those of you who are low sighted or listening in, I am a South Asian American director with dark skin. I have shoulder length black hair. I'm wearing a red shirt and I have a white virtual background behind featuring our series title, Directors Lab West Connects, and our hashtag, DLW Connects. Directors Lab West is a 20 year old volunteer run organization that every May provides an eight day intensive full of workshops, panels, masterclasses, and more for emerging and mid career theater directors and choreographers from all over the world. This year we jumped a hurdle and took advantage of this digital medium to mark the lab with Directors Lab West Connects. We are overwhelmed by your response and thoughtful questions from this week. Welcome to our eighth and final day of conversations crafted for you by theater directors and choreographers live streamed by our partners at HowlRound to their website and to our Directors Lab West Facebook page. Join the chat, tell us who you are, where you're tuning in from and type in your questions for our speakers. Um, some will be answered in the Q&A that follows. Thank you to Brittany Balance for providing ASL interpretation. She is a fair-skinned woman with her hair in a bun, glasses, and a green sweater, and a black background. Now I'd like to welcome our speakers, Sabra Williams and Laura Carlin. Sabra Williams has received international acclaim for her work as an actor, host, and co-founder of the Actors Gang Prison Project, including being named by President Obama a champion of change in 2016 and being honored with the British Empire Medal for Services to the Arts and Prison Reform by Queen Elizabeth in 2018. Sabra is a co-founder of Creative Acts, a social justice initiative that uses the arts as the tool for transformation, as well as a visiting lecturer at UCLA and a Bellagio Rockefeller resident fellow. Welcome, Sabra. Thank you. I am a light-skinned woman of color with uh, long, dark, brown, curly hair. And I am wearing a gray t-shirt with a pink logo that says Creative Acts. And I'm sitting at the entrance to a closet in my upstairs <laughs> room. <laughs> Thank you, welcome. We're so happy to have you. Um, Laura Carlin is a choreographer, teacher, and advocate for empowering people of all ages and abilities through dance. She founded Invertigo Dance Theater in 2007. She has created over 40 works for the company and has been presented at venues such as the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion, the Broad Stage, and the Ford Amphitheater. Laura is a founder and leading teaching artist for dancing through Parkinson's and storytelling through movement. And she believes dance is for everybody and every body. Welcome, Laura. Hello, um, thank you so much for having me. Um, I am uh, especially pale in this light. Um, uh, I have red uh, curly hair that is pulled back and I'm wearing um, a, green, a green romper and a funny, I don't know, pashmina that I found on the floor of my office and glasses. <laughs> thank you for your description. Thank you so much for both of you being here. Um, we're very excited about this. For everybody out there, uh, you can find their bios on our website at directorslabwest.com. And you can also find bios for our entire week of panelists at the same place. So we'll be in conversation for the next 30 minutes discussing the power of theater and dance in systems impacted communities. So before we shift, in, shift into questions from the Facebook chat, which please put your questions there. Um, I just wanna launch into a quick question for you guys and we'll just um, roll with this. <laughs> Uh, a moment before we do a question, and I know, sorry, we didn't plan any of this, which is why Rena looks like, why? Um, <laughs> but um, I realized that I am actually, I haven't done a big Zoom event yet, and I wonder uh, if we could all just take a breath together, because it, normally when I do Directors Lab West workshops, we're in space or we're in um, community together in a very direct way. But maybe we could all just wh wherever you are. Um, can we? Is that okay, Rena? Oh, that's wonderful. I love it. I was okay. going to ask the exact same thing. Perfect. Okay, excellent. So wherever, uh, Sabra, do you want me to lead something, or do you want to do it? No, just one unified breath. You okay, great. So uh, wherever you are, uh, just plant plant your feet into the floor or your sits bones into the chair, 
uh, take a moment, soften your focus unless you're driving, in which case sharpen up. And um, everyone at the bottom of your next exhale, take a pause. And then when you're ready, take a deep inhale. Let that breath fill your throat and your lungs, your belly. Hold it for just a moment and then soften and let it go. Thanks. Thank you. Um, it's been a very trying week. And so I'm very excited about this conversation with both of you. Um, yeah, thank you. So let's start with um, just sharing. I would love uh, I would love to hear you share a little bit about your work and and your work with systems impacted communities, and perhaps define it for our audience as well. Since I feel um, you know quite a few people might not understand what systems impacted communities are. So I would love to hear from both of you how you define it and how how did you find your way into it. Sabra, do you want to kick it off? Sure. Hi. Um, I have to start by saying, um, especially as a person of color, I'm sitting in this house on stolen Tongva land at a time when this country is on fire. And um, I have to honor my indigenous brothers and sisters and say to my Tongva brothers and sisters that I know so well, we will do better. So thank you for that. Everything I say today is to honor the lives of people of color who have been killed on the streets of this country, including the most recent George Floyd. And I'm sure he won't be the last. So I, everything I say and do today is in honor of our people. Um, and I will also say it's an honor of the people who are behind bars right now, who are terrified, who are in grave danger in this state alone in California, we have nearly 900 people who are positive behind bars and it's just beginning. We've had nine people die at the California Institution for Men and they're completely invisible. So when we talk about this virus of racism and the virus of the Corona virus, they both apply the most to people who are behind bars. Um, and that's what I mean by systems impacted. People who've been impacted by the systems that have been set up by um, white supremacy in this country and across the world, whether they be behind bars, formerly behind bars in the foster system, children's prisons, people who are targeted and arrested daily, and people who are traumatized by that are also systems impacted. So that's what I mean by the communities that I work with. Um, I'm an actor, an artist, and um, an immigrant. <laughs> I'm the mother of a young man of color. And uh, we came to this country in 2002 to shake our lives up. And boy, do we shake our lives up. Um, uh, came here to work as an actor. Did, I did not expect to, be, uh, to have an activist made of me by America. <laughs> And um, I started off, I joined the Actors Gang, which is Tim Robbins Theatre Company, as an actor. And I had been doing some work before in the UK with the English Shakespeare Company, uh, just performing plays in prison, that's all. Um, and so when I started doing work at the Actors Gang, it's highly emotional, physical work. And I noticed the effect that it was having on me, and I thought it would be great for prison work. And so I went to Tim and said, do you have anything I can be a part of? And he said, no, please invent something. And the prison project was literally born by me Googling. I was straight off the boat, like prisons in California. And um, I saw Pelican Bay and I thought, oh, that sounds super pretty. <laughs> it's not pretty. It's the only supermax prison in the state. Um, it was too far away to start at. So we actually start at the California Institution for Men in 2006, just bringing in a version of the workshop that the Actors Gang does every Sunday night with a whole bunch of exercises that I knew that I'd been doing as an actor. And the first day that we did it, we went in for four hours, no clue what we were doing with a bunch of guys who also had no clue what we were doing. And it had such a radical, transformation on their lives that we knew that we had something that we had to continue. 
Um, and so um, over the last, you know, fast forward 15 years, <laughs> I left the Actors Gang a couple of years ago and started Creative Acts and um, really wanted to work back with young people who are incarcerated because they are the most invisible of the invisible. And in LA County, they're allowed to vote, but you know, we knew that they weren't being engaged. So um, called to find out if they were being registered even. Turns out 600 of them were registered, but only 35 voted. So we knew we could do better. So we went into all nine children's prisons and um, you know, did a, a arts workshop that we call Art Attacks. And of those people, 86% of them voted in a primary election, simply because the arts were a much more effective um, way for them to understand their power and the tool of voting to make change in the community. So that's one of our programs. And then the other one, we're doing this crazy virtual reality re-entry program to help people have, um, who've done life sentences have a better experience so when they come back, they can hit the ground running in this fully computerized society, which I can talk more about later. But yeah, that's what we're doing. <laughs> Laura. Um, Sabra, I'm just so in love with you. <laughs> Feelings mutual from when we first met backstage. <laughs> No, well, so Sabra and I actually met each other um, at, um, if you want to talk in, about an incredible um, blend of community and art, um, we met backstage at uh, Independent Shakespeare Company where um, she was igniting the stage and um, where my company in Vertigo Dance Theater has a, a partnership every year and we perform with them. So, um, so I just, I love the, the web. Um, I founded in Vertigo in 2007, um, which is uh, 13 years, which is incredible to me that we're a teenager now. Um, and uh, in Vertigo is a local, it's a Los Angeles based uh, dance company. We blend high impact, uh, uh, highly kinetic movement with uh, theatricality. And we at the core of our mission is uh, along with high quality artistic uh, creation uh, woven into that is community and connection. And um, that's really the, the heartbeat of what we do. And that plays out uh, whether we're on stage or in studio or uh, working in classrooms um, with our community partners, uh, working with students um, or whether we are doing our Dancing Through Parkinson's or Dancing Through Life programming. Um, and I've been working within activism and, and working and thinking and um, uh, moving in that circle. I mean, I think since middle school, <laughs> I was the sort of pain in the ass um, I was a pain in the ass middle schooler that like didn't like friends because it was racist and homophobic, um, which is not a cute look uh, for a lot of people in like the late 90s, early 2000s. Uh, but I um, have been involved in queer rights activism for a really long time. And um, I have a dual degree uh, from uh, college. Uh, my first degree was in, was an honors degree of choreography and production, and my second degree was actually queer rights and social movements. So the plan coming out of college was to go to law school and be a, a queer rights attorney, uh, and instead I <laughs> am a choreographer now. Uh, so I started a dance company, obviously. Um, but I think what that's meant is that there is that that heartbeat of um, of looking at um, looking at creating space for stories where otherwise that space not might not be curated. Looking to invite people into um, the work, into their own bodies, into uh, witnessing things on stage where they otherwise might not feel invited. Um, and when I say systems impacted, I think that that Sabra did a, a beautiful job um, of of articulating it and um, what I would add um, is that there's, there's a lot of messaging about who art is for, whether it's dance or theater or any, any kind of art form. Um, 
and who is, you know, who is valid when they're practicing it um, and who is valid when they're witnessing it. And I think that um, making sure that we are um, constantly examining that and challenging it is, um, is part of looking at systems impacted. Uh, and also um, it's just, everything is so intersectional that, that we're constantly coming from an intersectional lens. And I think one of the reasons that we really use systems impacted is I don't like underserved. I think it doesn't mean, um, first of all, it's, it's such an overused word and you know, it's grant language. It's a way of, um, of elevating yourself um, when you are uh, writing a grant, like I'm gonna work with underserved populations. Um, and uh, I think that there's, there's a saviorism that, that is just ever so slightly a connotation for me uh, in that, that word. And uh, it also puts the onus uh, on, the, on that community, oh, they're underserved, as opposed to saying there's greater systems at play here and we need to examine those and we need to be challenging those and conspiring against those systems. Can I just, Nina, do you mind if I just add something? Please. I think that what you said is super important, Laura. And um, in fact, to me, it's one of the most important things about what we do in this country at this time. And that is, I work with thousands of people who are incarcerated or who are returned or who are systems impacted. And of those very, very few, maybe a handful have become artists or wanted to be artists. And I think that the issue in America as an outside eye, even though I am now an American as well, um, and this is why I'm writing a book about it, is that America seems to see the arts as for artists or for entertainment but does not in any way understand the absolute crucial importance of the arts for people who are self-described non-artists, who do not want to be artists in any way. And that's why we have to have the arts in the core of the school day, just like math, English, you know, anything. The arts have to be in the core of the school day because it gives a different way to learn in this very, very narrow way we have of educating people or of being successful in education in this country. And so what I've seen is that, you know, people, I remember getting a call from somebody who had done the program six years before and he called me, he'd been out six years and he called me and he said, oh, I just want you to know I'm sitting in my office today. My boss is being a douchebag and I am using every tool you ever taught me six years ago to stop myself from, you know, smacking him upside his head and leaving this job. And I think that, you know, that's what the arts are for, centrally must be for. And we just, if we understood that, we would fully fund the arts, the government would fund the arts, and it would be in the core of the school day. So I can't emphasize enough how important what Laura said is, and it's everything. It's our responsibility as artists. So, sorry to interrupt you, Rena. No, no. And sorry, I, uh, I'm going to try and speak slower. I know I speak super fast. Sorry. <laughs> well, I I want to bring it back to this idea of social culture changing by by what we do, our conduit of communication and um, diving into communities because um, there's dance, which is nonverbal, and then we have uh, performance art. You know, nonverbal meaning uh, it's a way to connect through our bodies and through our experiences with each other, right? With our breath and it's, um, it's something beautiful to think about. And I, I really wanna know how, how do you, because the work is so much about diving into a community to bring arts to uh, help grow as a culture and as a fabric of our society, how do you translate your work from, uh, from being a performer into, into the work you do with, with your organizations? for me there's no difference you know Shakespeare talks about it you know he talks about the the theatre being a mirror holding a mirror up to society I think that that's another issue that we have of separating the art from the social and you know I think especially at this moment in time in history at this in this pivot in history we're in right now all artists need to be on the front line and not necessarily I don't mean by that being 
on protests all the time, although we should be out there too. I mean, what I mean is like self-examining, you know, why am I an artist? What can my art do at this time? I personally, you know, when I'm performing, when I'm playing, I don't, I am also in the community. Like when I'm speaking, I'm, these are not written people. These are in my head. <laughs> these are characters that I play are people who really have lived in maybe just a different space than I live in, but they really have lived. And so when I step into their life, I'm also stepping into their community. And so I, I just, I don't see any division at all. <laughs> I don't know, what do you think, Laura? Um, I think that I've been, oh, I wasn't gonna talk about this cause it's not fully formed in my brain. This is so vulnerable. Okay, this is a thing, this is like a messy process I'm in the middle of biting into. So this, I'm gonna wander into it. Um, I've been thinking more and more about, you know, as the artistic director of a company, one of my primary, um, uh, joys is to create staged work along with the community engagement programming that we do. Um, and I've been thinking more and more uh, about what I've been trying to do uh, intuitively for a long time with a, a bunch of our different stage performances uh, and what I'm fighting against. And what I'm fighting against is this idea of the stage performance up here uh, and as this, this main event and that everything else that happens uh, in the process, any community engagement that happens uh, that I, I, as sort of supporting that or leading up to and lesser than, and it's so hierarchical. And it's what I see as, um, you know, in a lot of ways, it, it's a really patriarchal way of organizing our thoughts around um, the art and then the community engagement that there there is that hierarchy and also corporate as well <laughs> and and corporate yes which is also white supremacy which is also patriarchy which is also blah, blah. um I can't believe I just went like blah at all these <laughs> just like massive intersections of oppression uh anyways so <laughs> I'm trying to now take this idea of the content of the show as inspiring uh, community engagement that surrounds and feeds into and interacts with in a really genuine way, um, the work that the artists are doing, um, the dramaturgy, the, um, the rehearsals, the creation process are all uh, informed by and um, informative of the community engagement that's happening. And that's just really um, being something that we've been doing for a while, but not articulating. Um, so kind of allowing it to be more, not even horizontal, you know, taking it out of a vertical hierarchy and not going to a horizontal plane, but just sort of this messy spirally uh, way of thinking about it. Uh, in the Shakespeare Company, where we met, which I'm a member of this amazing company, theatre company, one of the things that uh, Melissa and David, artistic director um, of, um, Melissa's the artistic director of Independent Shakespeare Company, is that they've really been wanting to find ways to do what you're talking about. And one of the things we did that makes me super emotional, so I'll try not to as I've been crying the last week. Um, one of the things we did I thought was so beautiful is inside prison, I feel like, you know, we hold the space for us to together in partnership with people who are incarcerated to create a safe space and joy and creativity and play. And so what I was thinking was, wouldn't it be amazing if they, when they came back, could be involved in creating a space for us to play? And so what we did at Indie Shakes is that we had, um, in partnership with the Anti-Recidivism Coalition and alumni that I know, um, 
had invited them and paid them to come and build the stage because every year the stage has to be built in Griffith Park for our summer festival. And so we had, um, we've been doing workshops inside halfway houses, um, you know, for people coming back. And then we were also able to employ them to build the stage. And for me, it was super emotional to be walking on the stage where they've created the space for us in return to be able to play and be creative. And then they are all sitting in the audience. I don't know, it was just so beautiful. And now we're looking for ways to be able to invite them also to play on the stage and to build out something that is this give and take of creativity and just to really try to reimagine, because that's what Creative Acts is, that we're trying to reimagine this space. So we're trying to use an arts-based approach in corporate worlds, in you know, arts organizations to teach people how to become teaching artists. And even in our own organization, we are really, you know, it's a laboratory, right? So we're really trying to create a flat organization. Everybody's paid the same. We all get the same hourly amount. We all are like equally involved in what we create at Creative Acts. And obviously the buck still stops with me. I still take responsibility as the executive director, but that's it. Apart from that, that's it. And it's such an exciting relief kind of from, you know, so many arts organizations are super hierarchical and super corporate. We sit around tables discussing the arts, just like you would if you were in an office. And what we're thinking is what happens if you throw the table out the window? in arts organizations and use the arts in the process. And that's super exciting. And we've been doing that, even at the mayor's office of re-entry, we like basically did that with them as well, with a bunch of bureaucratic people as well. <laughs> it was awesome. <laughs> and yeah, it's hard. I feel that on a, a, I love going into spaces where they are not expecting, you know, to be pounced on by artists. Um, we do it with our Dancing Through Parkinson's programs. I'm constantly going into, um, uh, I and, and also our, my teaching artists and our team and um, uh, and we've been doing dancing through Parkinson's for ten or eleven years now and um, and going into spaces with neurologists or conferences and having an entire conference of people who work um, in neurology and neurobiology and um, standing up on stage and being like all right everyone stand up and take a breath and reach and um, and watching, I think it's really delightful to watch people understand um, and light up that that movement or storytelling um, is for them, uh, even if it's as you know as we were talking about earlier, even if it's not on a professional level, that there is um, that there is space for joy. I think that one of the things when we talk about systems impacted or you know or under resourced, you know we we really use language that is it, that presses down, um, that that literally like oppresses the communities that we're working with, unless we're really careful about that language, and it is and that affects the way um, we as artists can often come into communities, um, whereas I think it's really important to come in knowing that there is space for joy, that there is space for creativity, and that it is our job as artists to curate that space, to open it up, because joy, the idea that you have the capacity for joy can be a really um, intimidating um, one, or one that sparks a reaction um, if, if it's not done right. And uh, I think that it's our job to curate those spaces and to allow for them. You know, I think often most of what we're doing is giving permission. You and know, for me, I, yeah, I completely agree with what I always say and it's 100% true. I get the most joy in my life being in prison. And I know that sounds completely insane, but if there's so much joy and this agape love in the room, when you create a safe space for people to play and do difficult work, mm -hmm. it is the most joy I get in my life. Yeah, I agree. And I think that that's, um, it's something I look for in the work I make for stage and it translates into the work that we do um, in workshops and in classes. 
uh, I think that there's space for humor. Um, for a long time, when I started making work in Los Angeles, um, the the sort of general uh, style that was going on at the time was real serious because a lot of people in Los Angeles were real serious um, choreographers who were worried about being like taken for like the commercial world. Um, and they were worried about being seen as lightweights and, you know, wanted to be taken seriously. And so I was making work that incorporated humor. And so I was known as like the funny, oh, you're the funny one. It's like, well, yes, there, there's humor in the work and there can be humor in the way we teach and there's space for that. But really it's often through allowing people to laugh that you that they that we relax that we that we reconnect to our humanity and from there we can address deeply rooted traumas that we can address deeply um, complex questions uh, and we're doing so from a place that isn't so tight isn't so bound isn't so afraid because we've taken a, if you're laughing you're breathing. So I love this. I love this. We're, we're at 1130. So I want to bring back a couple ideas and also integrate some questions that our audience had today. Um, and one of the questions is in regard to COVID um, in our current epidemic, we, we keep talking about, you know, being together and the togetherness that our work is um, in this current pandemic where we're physically separated but obviously together and being able to communicate ideas. Um, how, how do you feel uh, we can integrate the work that we're doing now into um, and make it profitable emotionally and societally during the pandemic, considering that we have digital access, um, but not everybody has this access, right? So okay. how has the pandemic affected your work? Do you see ways of moving forward um, there's one question specific uh, where uh, Alicia Brady, she's new to directing and um, she's finding herself loving incorporating movement into the communication of performance, also feeling a true disconnect with COVID and the Zoom virtual theater world. Um, so what would you advise in terms of doing the work in this, uh, in this environment that we're in right now? Um, well, I'll start with what Invertigo has been doing. Um, and I actually came back to work um, from maternity leave on the day that the, the beat kind of dropped on COVID-19 in the US. I think outside of the US it had been, um, it had been a, a, known, a more known entity for a while, but I came back on the day that our office went remote. That was my first day back at work. And I sat down at the computer and in my very empty office um, and everything had changed, not just because I had had a baby, but because the entire world was different, um, you know, in a, in a moment. And what we do, and, you know, and I, I think Sabra, it's probably true for you as well, is it feels so physically um, or dependent on physical presence um, in a lot of ways. And, um, and it, we really had to take a moment and pause, especially with our Dancing Through Parkinson's programs and Dancing Through Life, because these are some of our more medically vulnerable um, communities. Um, people with Parkinson's are at incredible risk. And so we actually, the, I think a week or two before had suspended programming, in-person programming um, and then, you know, we had a meeting uh, with all of the teaching artists who are these incredible people. Um, and these women had lost, you know, in 48 hours, they'd lost their entire season's worth of gigs, their entire livelihoods. 
and yet they were on you know this video conference saying well has anyone heard from jack and and you know i know that so and so had surgery and does anyone know how she's doing and and oh i know that you know this person doesn't have um internet at her home and i'm worried about her has anyone called her and how can we start making sure that they're moving because you know people people need to keep moving and there was just such a, an incredible amount of love and that was um that was really um so heart filling for me and uh within two weeks we had dancing through parkinson's online and this is a group when we talk about you know oh the arts are so much more accessible in this time of covid because they're online and that really assumes a, a technological access um and it assumes a um a sort of digital nativism that um that doesn't exist for everyone. And so actually getting Dancing Through Parkinson's online was not really about getting the teaching of it online. Um, our teachers have had to learn how to teach. I, we have now uh, classes on both Vimeo and Zoom, and we're looking at other platforms as well. Um, but a lot of it is um, kind of a parallel process to getting people into physical space. It, you know, when we used to have people call the office and ask about dancing through Parkinson's, most of what we're talking about is how to be in a dance class, how to get there, where is the parking, what do I wear, what do I need to bring, what do I need to know, I'm not a dancer, you know, and most of what we're doing is allowing them to feel like they're invited into the space and training them or giving them resources to get into that space. Because once they're there, we're all teaching artists, we're all fine, we're gonna do a great job. It's getting them in there and then creating that space for them. And so actually what we did um, is we had one of our um, teaching artists was quarantined with her mom um, and her mom is kind of in the age range that a lot of our, our DTP participants are. And we made a, a video that is her signing her mom up for Zoom. And it we train people on how to use Zoom. And so that's like a part of the program is creating the structure that allows them into the space. And we're looking at ways to address, you know, technological access and Wi-Fi, um, which by the way, it should be like a publicly available thing now um, and forever. So just saying. Um, and I think that was, that was a big thing for a big deal for a lot of people because they felt like they were being trained and given access, but we're also looking at, um, what can we do? You know, is there a way we can have, um, pe a, a phone line that people can call into and just listen to the class? And, um, so yeah, I'll leave it at that. I have a lot more thoughts, but I want that to go. Um, I will just say that I'm noticing that um, we just, as humans who are living at this time in the world, we just want to know the answers. Everyone wants to be the first with the answers and we just want to know how it's gonna be. And like, you know, I feel like this time, it's a time of not knowing and we shouldn't know and that we have to sit in not knowing. <laughs> Um, you know, and to experiment and fail and experiment and succeed. Um, but I think that half of the lesson of this time is to just be like, I don't know. And let's see, let's see what happens. And so for us, all the prisons are closed as they should be, because the only way that virus got inside was by people from the outside bringing it in. So all the programs are canceled, all visits are canceled. Um, we were a week away, I think, from starting our virtual reality program in maximum security. And so, you know, it was, that's not something that we can do remotely. <laughs> um, so what we think we're gonna do with that one is to do the pilot in the community in a halfway house. So it's the same population of people who've done life sentences or multiple decades, and they're not quite back on the street yet. So they're just one step out of prison. They're still incarcerated technically. They have ankle bracelets. So we think we can do it in the community, which actually might be better because we can film it more easily and you know, respond better technically in the community. 
Um, but our, for our Art Attacks for the Juvie program, um, I hear that now they're doing their education online, their school online. So we're going to try and piggyback on that because last time we did it through their education program. So we're going to try and steal an hour, three days a week. Um, Get it. Get that hour. Yeah, and go around and drop off all the art supplies at each of the prisons so they have good quality art supplies for what we're asking them to do. But beyond that, I don't know. This is a time for us to self-reflect, I think, and to imagine and to be radical in reimagining. And, you know, I will say that when I saw a picture, I think it was the Berliner Ensemble, who I know and love, we were on tour with them at one point, and I saw their theater, how they're gonna open up with like two seats, one seat. I actually had a physical reaction. I actually felt nauseous and super sad. I don't really know why. I don't think it's a matter of compromising what we've done before. Theatre needs a radical makeover, a radical makeover. It is way too corporate. It's way too uh, profit-based. It is run by people who don't reflect the community that most of the theatres are in. And the work that's being done as a result is often not relevant or not, that's why we can't get audiences in, right? Or they can't afford to. So I think it's time for theatre to have a massive reimagining and a massive time of not knowing. And I know my friends- I mean, that's what's so exciting. Sorry, I interrupted you, oh God. Um, Zoom is so weird because you can't kind of- Yeah, it's hard to- like groovy back and forth. Um, but that's what's so exciting right now in, in the grief and in the loss, we are invited to crack open. As long as we do, because that's not our nature. Our nature is to try mm -hmm. to go as close to normal as we can. And the thing that I will say I miss the most is, I miss audiences. I hope audiences understand how important they are. That you know, this back and forth with audiences that we get to do on stage, I'm a former dancer, so whether it's a dancing or theater, then nothing can substitute for that. And we shouldn't try to make it. And so I don't know how we're gonna do it, and nobody really knows, even if they say they do, no one knows. So yeah, I miss me, my audiences and I'm super grateful more than ever for anybody who sat in an audience. It's just a beautiful thing. Yeah. And that's, there's, I think that there within that, I think it's really important that it's in the same way that we enter into communities if you are coming into a community and you know what you're going to, you know, what they need and what you're going to do to address those needs, you don't. Does anybody know? Um, you don't. Um, <laughs> and that's, I mean, and that, and that's yes. the sort of the, the hierarchical, patriarchal, you know, reaching okay. out you know, the outreach. I will reach out to you. I've had 15 um, years of being educated by the best teachers in yes. the world. And I see that Rena wants to ask us something. Sorry. <laughs> no, well, I think Rena wants to reach out to both of you because we're at time. Okay. Um, I, I know there's so much, um, so much to talk about. And this is such little time to talk about all the things that are encompassing our lives um, and our art and our work during this time. Um, briefly, one question we are asking all our, all our guests. Um, is is there anything that you would like to share about what you've learned about quarantine? I know we've touched on it in a couple different ways already, um, but anything that you specifically are hoping to incorporate because of this quarantine? Go ahead, Sabra. Let me just think for a second. If you have something, Laura, go ahead. Sabra and I are both thinking, I'd love that this is the one question we had in advance and we're both like, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I kind of, patience and vision you know I I think when I'm personally in something difficult well for many years now I've tried to develop a 300 year vision what can I do now that in 300 years is going to have a valuable effect to people who'll never know me no ne I'll never have existed I'll be dust in the ground not even that in 300 years and so on a smaller level when I'm struggling I try to think what about 30 years from now, me looking back on this time from 30 years? So in a way for me, that takes out my immediate emotional response and enables me to approach it with vision. So in 30 years or, you know, 
well, I won't be alive in 100 years, but, you know, it, let's say in 30 years from now, how will I look at what I did at this time, how I responded to this? Mm -hmm. And it's very interesting being a world citizen, you know, coming from Europe and having everybody nearly over in Europe. Um, and my husband is Ugandan. So like having that kind of different view on America, other countries are so often like, why are Americans freaking out about wearing masks? Like we just put on a mask and just do it and get it done, you know? And, you know, meanwhile we have the highest rate. So I think that um, for me, this thing of being outside and looking back or outside the country and looking at the country that I live in is super helpful in terms of reimagining and being radical and courageous and not being swallowed up in this moment and being honored by this moment. I'm honored that I am at a time in America that we might actually make a change to you know, 400 years of systemic abuse and racism. I'm actually working on, I don't know if I should say this publicly, maybe I should. I'm working on a truth and reconciliation process for America right now. We can't, that, that unless we address the indigenous genocide and slavery, among many other abuses, we can never go forward. We're always yoked to the past. So we have to, and as an artist, it's my responsibility. I can only do a tiny little bit, but you know, it's my responsibility to light a spark for that. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Did you have anything to add to that, Laura? Well, I've learned that I'm just very in love with Sabra and we're gonna run <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, uh, sure. <laughs> I this all intersects with having a new baby mm. so I feel like I've learned you know we, we talk about quarantine time how you know think March was 700 years long and you know April was 25 seconds um and I think that, you know, having, having a new baby um, messes with your sense of time anyway. So I came into this with a really, everything is now sort of like double warped time. Uh, and so I think I'm learning both patience and um, impatience with change, with the rate of change that I'm, I'm learning the moments that I can let surrender to what is happening. And then the times that rage and, um, and that there is an implacable, you know, when rage or an implacable rejection of um, the way things are is not a time for patience. I think I'm trying to learn when to be patient and when to um, and when to push against something and push forward and, and crack open with an absolute uncompromising need to to move uh, to reject to shift to cause this ripple effect and and that's it and it's interesting because sometimes because i don't want to come from a place of reactivity i want to come you know if i am um if i am pushing forward if there you know that it comes from a, a place of um of hope and uh, and generosity and leveraging privilege for for whatever it's worth. Yeah, um, urgency and patience. I have to say one very quick thing, yeah. Nina. I promise. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's super important. A friend of mine, Shaka Senkor, posted this thing on Facebook, like near the beginning of this, where he asked people who have been incarcerated to give advice to those of us who have never been in a lockdown or never been in a restricted. I don't like to say lockdown, a restricted space. And by the way, people, it is not like prison. Stop saying it's like yeah, prison. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. He was yeah. asking people to give advice <clears throat> who've been incarcerated to those of us who have been privileged not to be incarcerated. And it was such a beautiful moment because of course the advice was amazing, but also the beautiful thing about it, I was like, yeah, who's got the power now? 
right? They have the power. They're the people who are centered at this difficult moment. And they're the people who know how to deal with this. And it was just such a revelation and just so beautiful. And I think that this is opening up space for people who have not had power before. So thank you. So I just had to add that. No, I love it. I, um, we are, we're literally at time and I don't want us to get kicked <laughs> off mid sentence. Um, thank you so much for being here, your words and your work and contributing your time. Um, it's just, thank you so much. Thank you, um, so much. super grateful, thank you. And thank you, Brittany Balance, um, our ASL interpreter who brought our discussion to the broader community. We're so thankful for that. Um, since this is our last conversation and it's such an important one to me and to a lot of people, um, I wanna welcome back my fellow Directors Lab West Connects producers. So pop on up, <laughs> magic. Um, my producers are Sheree Adams, Douglas Clayton, Ernest Figueroa, Martin Jago, Cindy Marie Jenkins, Randy Trabitz, and Diana Wyan. Hello, everyone out there. We can't thank you enough for tuning in, whether this was your first time or your eighth. Over the past eight days, we've had over 6,500 people tune in from 37 states and 21 other countries. We are so grateful and inspired by your response to DLW Connects that we're discussing the possibilities for future virtual events. And uh, like the, uh, the other seven conversations this week, uh, this will be archived and available with closed captions on both HowlRound.com and DirectorsLabWest.com later tonight. And you can head there now to watch any of the conversations you might have missed. And we encourage you to share them online and off with your fellow theatre and dance artists. We want to again express our collective thanks to all our speakers who gen whose generosity of craft and spirit has made this possible. Anne Catanio, Sheldon Epps, Ann Bogart, Jessica Hanna, Ann James, Carly D. Wexstein, Laurel Lawson, Diana Wyan, Daniela Atencia, Gianna Formicone, Makiko Shibuya, Avit, Avivit Shaked, Scarlett Kim, Maddie Barber, Bockelman, Luis Alfaro, Lori Woolery, Saber Williams, and Laura Carlin. Thanks to our Directors Lab West colleagues, Anthony Ruffalo, Susan Dalian, and Elizabeth Suzanne for their assistance in connecting us to our wonderful ASL interpreters, Jess Whitehouse, Robert Cardoza, Aviva Levy, Ellie Streifer, Jennifer Brazel, Dana, Danny Casey, Alan Whitborg, and Brittany Balance. And now we want to extend a huge thank you to our partners in this venture, HowlRound. Uh, so thank you, Vijay, Matthew, Thea Rogers, uh, Jamie Galoon, and tra uh, Travis Amiel, and the whole team at HowlRound. Uh, a special shout out to Travis, who's actually been with us every single day behind the stream, uh, behind the scenes, making this live stream possible, and also behind the scenes and uh, Definitely want to give a shout out to our production coordinator, Emily Clays. Thank you for sticking with us and continuing to coordinate when we decided to make this virtual jump. And we'd also like to once again acknowledge our longstanding partners at the Stage Directors and Choreographer Society, Pasadena Playhouse, and Boston Court Pasadena. We're excited to be back next year. We also want to say hello to all of our alumni out there. It's been a great opportunity to reconnect with all of you. With 20 years of labs under our belt, you are now over 600 strong. And it's been a real joy to see so many of you in the Facebook chat every day asking questions and reconnecting with us and with each other. And speaking of next year, if you haven't attended the lab before, please head over to directorslabwest.com, click on email sign up, and you will get notification when the next application is online and of all our uh, future virtual. Uh, events and offerings. And also please do like our Facebook page and follow us on Instagram at Directors Lab West. For 20 years, we have produced an eight day, 12 hour a day in-person lab full of workshops and panels, masterclasses, performances, and uh, more based in Pasadena, California, bringing together emerging and mid-career theater directors and choreographers from, uh, choreographers from all over the world. It's been um, our pleasure to continue our mission and reach out and broaden our connection by offering these additional eight days of conversations crafted for and by theater directors through D and choreographers through DLW Connects. Uh, 
And we couldn't have done it without you. I want to quote Sabra in saying, I hope the audiences realize how important you are. Mm -hmm. And we couldn't have done it without you. Thank you for joining us from all over the US and the world, several countries, and for being an integral part of our community. We look forward to, as Bo Anne Bogart said, sharing some time across virtual space again. Another quote I want to do with Anne Bogart, also slow the F down, and, <laughs> and sharing time with us. Until then, from our home to yours, we wish you all well and safety. And we, as we've said before, we hope these, these conversations spark many, many, many more. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.